What's up, Theology Nerds? This is Trip. Before we jump into the podcast, I just want to tell you a secret that, indeed, the internet is correct. The secrets are true. Uh, and if you want to know what the secrets are, that's right. Secrets about what Peter Rollins and I are going to do together this summer in flyover country, uh, then uh, you want to text Beer Me Jesus, no spaces, to 44222. That's Beer Me Jesus to 44222. Too. And you will be on the email list of all the people that will get the secrets sent to them right into their email box. Plus, make sure you check out the Homebrewed Facebook page because Pete and I are going to be doing some Facebook Lives at the beginning of March uh, to share some details and honestly just to answer some questions, catch up, and play around on the internet. All right, see you there. Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, theologians of all shapes, sizes, and persuasions. This is the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast, bringing you some ideological ingredients so you can brew your own faith. My name is Tripp, and today on the podcast, I am talking to Paul Henlicky. That's right. Uh, he is the professor of Lutheran studies at Roanoke College, and we're talking about his, his new book, Divine Simplicity, Christ, the Crisis of Metaphysics. And if you, if you're a theology nerd, just prepare yourself because this is about to get real. That's what I'm saying. That's what I am saying. This was an excellent conversation. What did you think, Nathan? I thought it was fantastic. It was one of my favorite uh, episodes this year so far. Well, well. And, um, you know, this is the second month, so it's not like you're just competing against two now. All right. But we hopefully other people aren't listening because you it's like your first word isn't just an affirmation in a vacuum. It was judgment. You... <laughs> But uh, yeah, so today, um, uh, when we in the conversation, we talk about divine simplicity. Uh, we talk about the way uh, Christology is a challenge to the normal way of doing metaphysics. We discuss divine revelation, um, situatedness of knowledge. We discuss um, how if you if you if you if you hang out long enough with the Aquinas. and in in the, some of the older theologians, you get some ideas that brought to today. Uh, get a little radical. Um, and, and here's the other thing. Then we get in this discussion uh, around uh, the false gospel of inclusiveness. Mm. It gets a little edgy. Um, and, and, and he even says in it that there is no more inclusive theological statement than the word flesh. Boom. That's a good one. Oh, that whole, and I'm not going to tell you all he's going to say around it, but I was like, he said it, and I was like, ah, that's going to be tweeted. <laughs> um, and he discusses how, um, as, as people of faith, uh, we look and we understand our history and our stories retrospectively as hope projected backwards. Mm. That was a fun bit. Um, and, 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 and he said that. Uh, the, the, the questions around inclusiveness in the gospel, there are these radical things. But then the church has basically, uh, turned, uh, inclusiveness into, uh, the lazy man's version of tolerance. Mm -hmm. And that's not a theological type of inclusiveness. And so it, it actually ends up abolishing and collapsing difference, which is the, the opposite of what yeah. the gospel's about. I mean, it's, it is, it is packed full of excitement. So, you know, buckle your safety belts. Oh, that, that's a good line. I think people should say that more often because there is such thing as theological safety belts. And if you don't believe me, you better ask somebody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, um, before we jump in the podcast, I just want to tell you, uh, uh, thank you for all those who've recently joined the homebrewed Christianity community. Those are the people that donate each month to keep the podcast, this podcast, the Theology Nerd podcast and everything connected to homebrewed uh, kicking and going. Uh, if you want to support the podcast and connect with us in the secret Facebook group, uh, supply content, questions, and ideas for stuff going on at the podcast, and then join the live interactive uh, sessions, uh, the reading groups, and all that kind of stuff, then go to homebrewedcommunity.com, and, uh, and then just say, just like, I'll tell you thank you in advance. So thank you. Thank you. We've already assumed you've done it, so thank you for doing that. Yeah. Yeah, it's like good parenting. I'm so glad you got up this morning and cleaned your bedroom. I will come back and look at it in 30 minutes. <laughs> I don't, I've never done that. You should try it. See, how, see if it works. I don't know. I'm pretty sure that it would not work. <laughs> and the reason is my son Elgin already has a clean room. 
because he mm-hmm. doesn't know how not to have a clean room. See, there you go. In the moment I would start debating cleanliness with Elgin, who, like my wife, is very... Uh, very neat. Yes. Uh, Alicia and Elgin, very neat. They would both say, there's a reason we close a door to one room in the house. <laughs> Dad, why do you just have books and papers just stacked all over the place? They're not just stacked. They're organized. Well, they, it is not organized well. <laughs> anyway, um, nonetheless, nonetheless. You know what uh, is organized well? What? This interview. Oh, oh five points, Nathan. So here we go. Uh, we're going to talk about divine simplicity. And when you listen to it, uh, make sure you go to homebrewedchristianity.com so you can get uh, the, you can click over to Amazon when you get it so we get a little kickback because anytime you go through it, Homebrewed and then get to Amazon and get sweet books like Divine Simplicity or the Homebrewed Christianity Guide to God which is the newest one in the series out then then we get a little kickback it doesn't change your experience and uh, everything everything in the world is just like an itty bit brighter <laughs> maybe not but you won't know till you try it alright peace hello Homebrewed Christianity listeners this is Trip, and today we are going to talk about divine simplicity. And um, th- this is going to be quite a bit of fun. And that's actually the title of the book, Divine Simplicity, Christ, the Crisis of Metaphysics. And we're joined by Paul Hinlicky. Is that how you say it? Hinlicky, yeah. Hinlicky, which is a pretty cool last name. It is not, it's not normal. It's not boring. Um, and, and then when you have uh, really devout followers, do they go by Hinlickians or uh, Hinlickist? Um, I, I, you know, you'd have to ask them. I have no idea what they'd call themselves. <laughs> well, um, and, and you are a professor of Lutheran studies at Roanoke college. And, um, so, uh, and, and this is, uh, this, this book is actually connected, I think, to conversations that are happening in, in theology now about uh, really theologians reattending to the question of God, the reality of God, right. uh, what it means for Christians to have a, a doctrine of God uh, that's robust. Um, and, and, and I wonder if you can explain to people who aren't professional theologians, what in the world were theologians do, doing in the years where they just didn't talk about a real God? I mean, I, I, in one sense, it is a radical book. It's a, a part of a new conversation around the doctrine of God. In the other sense, you go, well, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah, in one of my recent books, I kind of wistfully sighed about this uh, modern eclipse of the concern about the reality of God in a lot of modern theology. And I just said, when did theologians stop being interested in theology? <laughs> you know, it was a, and I think, the, I mean, following Karl Barth, uh, there's, a, I think, a well-known uh, and largely correct answer to this question. Uh, the rise of modern science and the Enlightenment's critique of the role of Christianity in politics and his history and culture uh, led to uh, attempts to give non-theological accounts uh, to religion. And, you know, Feuerbach is the first in a long line of people thinking like this. And uh, theologians uh, reeling under the weight of this uh, attack uh, and critique um, uh, kind of gave away the store uh, by saying, well, Feuerbach's right. We're really talking about humanity and humanity's ideas of perfect being and uh, the evolution and development of ideas about God. And this is still the predominant approach that's taken in so-called religious studies. Um, uh, 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 Karl Marx, in his theses on Feuerbach, blew the whistle on the whole thing, though. He said, you know, if, if it's if, if it's true that God does not make humanity in his image, but human beings who make God in their image, well, it would be better just to be done with the whole foolish game and take over God's job and do the work of God ourselves. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't think these kinds of theologians have faced up to Feuerbach's or uh, Marx's theses on Feuerbach's, frankly. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things I know that uh, that's that's a part of this has been the way in which 
our understanding of God or God's self-testimony or, or revelation has been parsed through the history of the church, um, drawing distinctions between like natural revelation or special revelation um, and, and whether the Trinitarian nature of God um, is or particular divine attributes are uh, c- constructions or are, are really God as God is in God's self. Can you, can you kind of let us in on what you think are the theological uses to these challenges that, um, that these philosophers bring, but where you see the steps where when religious communities and its theologians internalize them, you're, you're really deflating whatever it is we talk about when we're getting around to talking about God. Yeah, that's a great question. Of course, you could spend a semester probing all the dimensions of that. But let me just say, again, rather simply and following uh, the well-known uh, thinking of Karl Barth here, uh, I, I would simply say let, the, let all theologians pass through this fiery brook. That's Feuerbach in German, fiery brook. Uh, uh, let, because it burns away um, um, these, um, um, this um, projection of anthropological uh, wishes on the blank screen of deity, it, 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 it blows the whistle on the whole thing and, and disqualifies it. And really, in, as Bart thought, it, it delivers us from an awful lot of idolatry. Uh, it leads us to the uh, humiliating, humbling uh, insight that only God speaks truly of God. Uh, and um, uh, uh, something that Plato, that the beginning of this process of reflection said in the Timaeus uh, <clears throat> to think that God is is one thing but to declare declare God is beyond all telling so I, I think that um, it, it kind of uh, 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 brings us to the point of understanding that we can only speak of God in response to God speaking to us and we can only speak in response to God speaking of us in this risky stance of faith. Um, and so faith then has to give an account of its knowledge of God. It has to confess what it has, it has heard God speaking. And now that is not um, a, a totally fideistic claim at all, because uh, the world is in fact full of putative words from God. And these putative words from God are quite meaningfully um, uh, debated among uh, believers and non-believers. Uh, so we're we're really kind of getting away from the um, uh, uh, anthropological orientation of the Enlightenment into a postmodern <clears throat> kind of culture, in in which there's a certain epistemic humility recognizing that there's a pluralism of discourses about deity um, and they uh, uh, no one stands out of the circle of revelation and faith but standing within a, a circle of revelation and faith one recognizes kindred fa- kindred family resemblances between mm-hmm. many discourses regarding God and one is able to enter into friendly, uh, hopefully friendly, if necessary, uh, not so friendly, a discussion, debate, and disputation with other discourses. So when, when you um, are, are engaging the question of divine simplicity, uh, if you're trying to explain or introduce divine simplicity to to students that have no idea what in, what in the world you would attach simplicity to God, that God seems like a pretty mysterious and complex thing, um, what, how do you begin to explain what a theologians have meant when they've discussed divine simplicity? Yeah. I think the, the, the best route in teaching theology to students is always to take the biblical path because that's the, the narratives of the Bible are known or can be taught more easily and they, uh, have this, uh, um, uh, authoritative, authoritative function of guiding thought. Um, they they they're given to theology as what is before thought, uh, and it's essential to the biblical witness to say Shema Yitzrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Hear O Israel, the Lord, the Lord alone, um, or the Lord is one. Um, 
better translation, the Lord, the Lord alone. But in any case, uh, this gets translated into the Greek of the Septuagint to say you know, that, that God is one. And Paul, the apostle, picks this up in his first letter to the Corinthians in an exchange with the Corinthians about the oneness of God and meat being sacrificed to idols and whether that should be tabooed by Christians and uh, the debate, well, we know there's no God but one and the idols have no real existence. But on the other hand, there are many so-called gods and lords. But for us, there is only one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, etc. So, you know, you, 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 you ask the question, why in the Bible is it important to affirm the oneness of God? Um, and there's a kind of a double answer. Uh, 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 God is the singularity, the one and only, who is the creator of all that is not God. Uh, and this uh, emerges in ancient Israel by the time of the so-called second Isaiah, the prophet of the Babylonian exile. Um, uh, who is, uh, has Yahweh declare, I am God and there is no uh, n- none other, right? Uh, so you are, when you speak of God, uh, speak of God truly, you're speaking of one who is literally incomparable, incapable of being compared mm-hmm. uh, uh, to a creature who is qualitatively other than a creature. Uh, and of course, that means, in some ways, like I said earlier, with regard to Plato, we're reduced to silence. I can only speak of God if, in the event of God speaking to me, uh, and re- my responding uh, in repentance and faith uh, to that speech of God. Um, and so, in one sense, it's to reverence the holiness, the uniqueness, uh, the otherness of God. Um, God is one and one only, one that's qualitatively one and not therefore comparable to any other. Uh, but a second reason uh, 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 for for this concern uh, with uh, simplicity uh, is that uh, human beings cannot prove, demonstrate, control, manipulate, or predict God. Uh, that to speak truly of God is always to be in a position uh, of risky faith uh, in which the truth of one's statements depends on God's confirmation. Mm-hmm. God must confirm the truth of creatures' language about God. So th- those two uh, um, uh, um, uh, concerns, um, uh, really the first table of the Ten Commandments, the de- first table of the Decalogue, are all about uh, this proper respect, uh, reverence, um, uh, reserve regarding uh, true speech about God. So when we're using speech about God, it's obviously even revealed language is still human language. And these events that we point to in history, be it the Exodus or, or the cross or something, are historical events. And we point to Jesus um, – and, and and he was a person and mm-hmm. it like how do you understand both god's self testimony and the sense that those experiences are <clears throat> mediated or, or they're historically mediated in in different ways mm-hmm. well I, uh, this is a great question and it um, leads us now directly into the uh, the trinity the trinitarian mm-hmm. uh, side of the uh, question um um, to say that it's sim- it's simply not satisfactory um, uh, to say simply that God is one. Um, uh, why? Because uh, that leaves us uh, no further than uh, Plato. Um, uh, uh, that there may be uh, what, the one who is good, yes, but what? What about it? What can we say about it? What can we know about it? Impossible to declare. And a lot of theology today is more platonic than it is biblical. It is more interested in debunking 
the anthropomorphisms, the human persons, the historical events of biblical narrative, and pointing out, as you just did, that these two are, these are human words. Uh, well, they're human words with this difference. They're human words that are responding to the putative speech of God. Uh, and that, I think, is uh, simply a fact uh, that can be registered about biblical narrative. Mm-hmm. Biblical narrative is confessional. It is written from faith for faith, and it grounds itself as a human language that is in prayer, praise, and thanksgiving, responding to the speech of God. And in fact, uh, God's speech to us and our speech about God constitute a kind of unity all through biblical narrative. It's it's not a, a, a not a, a pure identity, but uh, it's a, a, a harmony, a, a unification of creator and creature that occurs in, in this language. Now, to fill that out, that thought out more fully, uh, moves us in the direction of the Trinitarian understanding of God, um, that um, um, God is um, a, the self. Um, um, that that for the Bible to be God is to give. Let me just start with that. A way of understanding the statement "God is love" is to understand that to be God is to give. God is the infinite generator of all that is not God, as I said earlier. Uh, and this truth is true both um, of God in, etern- in internally and in God's own eternal life. And therefore, also true of God's self-relating to creatures. Uh, it's true both internally and externally that to be God is to give. Uh, and the doctrine of the Trinity uh, expresses that by saying that to be God is to be the Father who eternally generates his Son on whom he breathes his Spirit so that in the Spirit, the Son returns to the Father the praise of his deity, ad infinitum, from eternity to eternity. That uh, uh, mutual dance of the three is the divine being in the becoming that is uh, divine love. And so also in the um, economy, in the biblical history of salvation, uh, God uh, appears to us in exactly the same way. Uh, We speak of God as our Father because the Son invites us into his own relationship uh, with the Father and breathes upon us his own spirit. Uh, so that we dare to call ourselves united uh, to the Son, Jesus, the children of God, uh, uh, who cry, Abba, uh, Father. God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So when you put these two ideas together, the uniqueness and singularity of the creator of all that is not God, that simplicity, and you put together the complexity of the God who gives creation, which he, he redeems and fulfills through the missions of his Son and his Spirit, uh, you have the Christian doctrine of God, a trinity uh, of persons that's qualified by an absolute uh, uh, proviso of, of uniqueness, holiness, otherness, uh, 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 incomprehensibility, mystery, something like that. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things that um, that you that you do in the book is engage both theological, doing constructive theology, but engage biblical studies and philosophy mm-hmm. uh, in each chapter. And you're doing it not just uh, with kind of contemporary biblical studies or contemporary philosophy but engaging biblical studies and philosophy as they've been engaged throughout the history of the church. Right. And, um, it, and it, it gives uh, a level of richness to each, uh, to the book that 
um, not many theologians uh, do that anymore, right? Like they tend to be, oh, I'm a philosophical theologian or I'm dealing with uh, a scripture um, and the, the worst are philosophical theologians who write the book and then assign a TA to go find Bible passages or stories. <laughs> um, and, 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 and I wonder if you could just say a bit about like how the question of divine simplicity it sets up engaging philosophy and biblical studies for the purpose of doing constructive theology. That's another super question. And I, you know, I don't really think we can do any of these tasks well in isolation. Uh, a certain narrowness. Um, I mean, there, there's a certain depth that can be achieved by a narrow focus, uh, but the, the lack of breadth, the lack of scope in these kinds of studies that you're talking about, uh, you know, really, uh, I mean, no wonder people are turned off by the study of theology if, if that's the fare they have to live on. Um, so I think the theologians today, um, if they're serious about theology, have to try to be far more interdisciplinary uh, and consciously so uh, when we're thinking of the narrow disciplines of the modern academy. Um, now, um, uh, I think a simple way of understanding what I argue in the book is that the Greek philosophers going back to the pre-Socratics uh, were obsessed uh, with the question of origins. If I can know how the world began, I will have the lever on which to make, you know, I will know the mechanism by which I can cause events to happen in the future. So the quest for the, the first cause, the quest for the origin of the world, uh, was really a kind of proto-scientific quest for um, uh, the knowledge of causes uh, through which the human knower would then be empowered uh, to control, manipulate, and predict uh, future events. And uh, this is true of metaphysics as well. Metaphysics uh, is uh, the, the, the discipline that looks to the initial condition um, as famously, for example, in uh, Doctrines of God as the First Cause. Uh, when you read the Bible, of course, there's an interest in the origins. It's called the Book of Origins, Genesis in our English language. Uh, but the whole Book of Genesis we know today is written um, retrospectively from the standpoint of faith in the promised future of God. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's the promise to Abraham um, uh, and the whole history of promise that evolves uh, forth from that point, as Jürgen Moltmann pointed out so wonderfully in my youth in his great book, Theology of Hope. The biblical narrative is not past-oriented, uh, it's future-oriented. And when it takes up the question of origins, it's always from the perspective of this eschatological faith in the future. Uh, of God, uh, the coming of uh, what I call the beloved community of God. Uh, and, and so even its reflections on origin are, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it, hope projected backwards. Uh, what must hope in the future God promises us? Um, what, what must hope think about how the world began uh, and why we're in the predicament we're in? and what God is doing in the interim to bring about the redemption and fulfillment of the creation gone awry. Um, so I, I say in a, you know, simple way, philosophy is about protology. Metaphysics is about trying to go back and uncover the misty origins of things, but theology is eschatological. It's oriented to God's promised future. And, and one of the things that um, that you do in the book is uh, is is kind of come to this impasse where theologians have avoided really dealing with the doctrine of God and um, and 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 you confound it Christologically uh, and that that 
your Christological reflection is not just uh, it, it, you know, like the subtitle of the book, a crisis of metaphysics in the sense that, oh, how do you talk about this metaphysically? It's uh-huh. a crisis of metaphysics um, it, methodologically too, that a lot of Christian theology is not distinctively uh, Christian in that its method and the way it even reflects about God doesn't begin in the very place the word of God was made flesh. It begins uh, uh, bringing in these kind of unexamined assumptions, patterns, and methods uh, from other disciplines. Um, could you uh, can you say a, a bit about that? Like, what does it mean to have Christ be the place we begin to talk about God? Because I think the natural tendency in our culture, especially not just in religious studies department, but in a, a, a growingly pluralistic culture, is uh, to shed our distinctiveness in hopes of being inclusive with very broad categories of religion or spirituality or God or the one or mystery. And in this, the, the book is, I mean, directed in a the, with a theological tone to the challenge, but I think it's just challenging in general to Christians who um, feel like they're being generous to their neighbors when they uh, deflate the particular or eschatologically shaped uh, of their God talk. Yeah, that's a that's another really insightful um, um, statement and, and comment and question. Uh, one of the ironies of contemporary inclusiveness uh, is that it tacitly wants to abolish all difference, and so the kind of inclusiveness it achieves amounts to a homogenization, um, a leveling of difference. This, in spite of constant protests about othering. Uh, 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 well, maybe is reflected in protests about othering. After all, the challenge of beloved community is to acknowledge difference as difference and, and not to uh, level it down to some kind of uh, com- commonality or sameness. And the, the, the great calling is to achieve relationships of love uh, which others who are genuinely different from ourselves, and I would include them in that, of course, people who are religiously different. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I, I think inclusiveness in the kind of bowdlerized way that you just described is, is, is uh, 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 the lazy man's uh, tolerance. Uh, tolerance, you know, meant living with people politically and civilly with whom I deeply and profoundly disagree. <laughs> it doesn't mean cheaply getting along with people because we have no real disagreements worth arguing about. Um, so uh, I think there's a kind of a false gospel of inclusiveness. Uh, I'm uh, really stretching at this on a conceptual level. I don't, of course, at all mean on the level of civil society uh, where Christians are obligated to love all uh, uh, as they love themselves uh, without any kinds of qualifications there. <clears throat> uh, but now more to the theological question. I don't know how more universal or inclusive you can be than to say the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Uh, it, it seems to me that the incarnation is the... Uh, quite literally, the the embodiment of the universality of divine love uh, for all creatures. What's challenging about the incarnation is not its uh, particularity, uh, but its necessity. That's what's offensive. Uh, 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 We proclaim Christ crucified, folly to Greeks and a stumbling block to Jews. Um, why is it folly and why is it a stumbling block? Because it asserts not simply a kind of uh, a universal love of God for all creatures, but because it asserts that this is this way, the way of the crucified Christ, is how the love of God actually reaches us and finds us in our state of, of estrangement uh, and guilt and 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 and, and death, uh, and that's what's offensive about it. And there's no way to avoid that offense, uh, it's, as it seems to me. And 
So in our kind of culture, you know, in the right way, Christians have got to gather uh, um, the courage of their convictions and with the apostle, be not ashamed of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, when you said that, you know, there's no more inclusive theological statement than the word becoming flesh, I think um, some people could, you know, uh, push back and and feel uncomfortable with it, but I think part of it is a lot of times our discussion of inclusivity isn't even theological at all, mm-hmm. um, and and I think the other side of that kind of inclusive statement, it's a theological statement because it's about God, what mm-hmm. God is including in the divine life by becoming flesh, by participating by through the incarnation, what God's coming to share, and in the Gospel of John. Um, that the, the prologue ends by saying that the word of God came to its own and they knew him not. Yeah. And, and I wonder if, if certain preoccupations around this kind of uh, lazy man's tolerance, as you said, uh, misses, we think we're doing God a favor by being more ambiguous, mysterious, distance, inclusive. And what we're failing to do is recognizing, um, the impossibility of understanding, encountering, receiving the uh, revelation of God, apart from God coming to us and creating even the conditions for possibly receiving God. We've like naturalized revelation in hopes that everyone gets a piece, mm-hmm. and in doing so, uh, kind of forsaken the, the profundity uh, that's at the very heart of the gospel. Yeah, I would agree with that entirely. I think in, in, for many of us, the Holy Spirit has become a total fifth wheel, um, and the, the the Spirit's creation of a of a theological subject to receive and believe Christ as the theological object is 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 consigned to revivalism and other forms of uh, offensive Christianity that uh, that we're, we, we've grown beyond or something like that. Um, but my goodness, uh, there, there is no Christian life uh, if there is no Holy Spirit uh, to crucify the old Adam, the old self with Christ. Uh, can we say with Paul any, any longer, I am crucified to the world and the world is crucified to me? Far be it for me to boast except in the cross of Christ my Lord. I mean, can we do, do Christians uh, even think that anymore? <laughs> it's a great question. And I think I, I just would one more thought about what you said. I think th- the problem is not just that we're afraid of Christian distinctiveness. I think that the alternative, this culture of lazy tolerance and, and cheap inclusivity, is a is, is a phony house of cards. I think in the recent election, we have seen that identity politics creates an abyss uh, um, uh, of 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 reaction uh, that is going to dig us into a hole from which we will be lucky to escape. Um, and and. It, in some ways, the, the 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 shallow analysis that the problem with the sin of racism is that we've not included others in our superior way of life, uh, and playing that that line out for all it's worth has got us into this mess mm-hmm. where white resentment uh, has said two can play at this game. And now uh, uh, we see the the the, the fruit uh, of a analysis of social diversity that, in principle, abolishes difference and does not recognize that the way to deal with difference is through the love, love of what is different, love of what is other, not by pretending that we're all the same. Mm-hmm. And I, I and that really connects to a conversation. And you know, if you're listening to the podcast, it I don't remember. I won't know which one comes out first. But the episode with uh, Miroslav Wolf and this conversation came up. And and one of the questions I asked him, and uh, and I'm interested in, is how uh, as more progressive Christians have shifted their um. Com- 
their their identity to being advocates for identity politics, how that has impacted our articulation of the gospel. And, and, and you know, I know no theologian is going to say, oh, identity politics or the gospel. But I think a lot of churches and a lot of uh, leaders um, basically preach and act as if that's true. Mm. And it's become uh, uh, destructive for the church's own self-definition and its integrity and being able to be distinct. And, uh, and, and I wonder if there's a, uh, what it is that's in that fight, um, that's problematic. Cause I remember having a conversation with a couple of other younger theologians and, and, and ministers where, um, it's as if we've decided our moral discourse assumes um the the politics of of uh recognition where uh, mm. if you have not been recognized properly as an individual or as a community by the powers that be then your identity is under threat and and it's experienced as an act of violence uh because uh, so we as christians just assume that's obviously the moral discourse and then become advocates as progressive christians for including another letter in identity politics or including recognition politically of an ethnic group or a past uh historical grievance or whatever and then on the other side our conservative christians are experiencing every act of inclusivity as a threat to their identity because they too have internalized this enlightenment very market driven logic of the self yeah. and, the, and what both sides are doing are having partisan identity politic fights rather than going perhaps the affirmation that god was in christ and the word became flesh and was finished when it was lifted up was uh, is one that just problematizes success by including people in a system in a regime that's inherently destructive and i and i don't i to me there's a sense that um both sides of this fight we're seeing showing up in the church is revelatory that our our theological understanding and our self definition of the church and as christians has uh has been uh hijacked and one of the things i I really like about this book and a number of the theologians publishing about the distinctiveness of what Christ does for our self-understanding, self-definition, and such as uh, as Christians and as a church is I think it gives us a, a chance to um, kind of reframe or begin again to tell the gospel that doesn't assume so much of our culture as uh, as as divine. Mm-hmm. No, right on. Preach on, brother. Well, sometimes I get distracted when uh, talking and, uh, and, and and begin thinking out loud, just because I uh, I mean, I'm enjoying talking to you. But do you in your in, I mean, do you have a sense of how you see the inattentiveness to the doctrine of God showing up in the life of the church and its own and how it understands its vocation? Yeah, sure I do. Um, just to, uh, to piggyback on your distinction between progressive and conservative uh, Christians, uh, one of my theological friends, Christine Helmer, recently wrote a book called The End of Doctrine, in, in which um, she says something, I think, profoundly Augustinian, uh, profoundly Lutheran, uh, that um, um, everything in nature and history is uh, um, is is the reality of God's creative work impacting uh, upon us? Uh, God is not an idea. God is the reality of the Creator immediately affecting uh, His creation uh, at every moment, including <laughs> right now this conversation trip between you and I is an immediate effect of God's creativity. Now, Christine Helmer's concern here, and I share this with her, is to say that God may be more than these immediate effects, but he's certainly not less than these immediate effects. And when we talk about God, the creator of all that is not God, we have to be have a reality check that our language is actually talking uh, 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 about uh, 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 this hic et nunc reality. Uh, 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, to be sure, when you break with idealism and theological idealism, and for heaven's sakes, all of modern theology after Kant is idealistic, uh, when you break with this idealism and you say the point is not uh, the his- historical evolution of ideas about God and how they get better and better or more inclusive, as we were saying earlier, or something like that, uh, but when you take your point of departure in in the reality, in reality, as Bonhoeffer was very concerned to say this, attacking the theological idealism of the 19th century, then the task of theology becomes urgent because it's not clear in this here and now reality what the will and purpose of God is. When Luther talked about the light of nature, he said an honest man would be driven by it to something closer to atheism, uh, something blasphemous like atheism, uh, uh, an honest person would in the light of nature. Uh, the Christian message is that a light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And that light is Christ, and that light is the incarnation uh, of, of that Philippians 2 talks about, the mind of Christ that Paul says believers have and, and know, and so forth. Um, so it's a matter of some urgency when we are dealing with reality to let that light of Christ shine, because otherwise we are in deep darkness and don't know uh, who God is and what God is doing with us. Uh, it seems deeply ambiguous uh, and so forth. Uh, so you have a certain urgency about uh, uh, theology shining the light of Christ when you take this reality orientation. And I think the problem with conservative and progressive Christians is that they're both different kinds of idealists. They're both people thinking, I've got a traditional idea of the Christian idea of God, and I want to preserve it. Or they're saying the traditional Christian idea of God is not adequate to the challenges of today, so let's modify it. They're, they're trading in idealisms. Neither of them are dealing with reality. Well, and one of the things that uh, that you develop in the book is the you call it Christological, uh, the Christological apophatic uh, type of thinking, and you you discuss the coincidence of opposites, not at the metaphysical or doctrine of God level, which uh, is popular these days, uh, but as a coincidence of opposites for understanding the Christ crucified. Right. Uh, can, can you say a bit about appropriating this, the, 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 uh, this type of category that develops in kind of medieval uh, Kusa and friends uh, and using it with Luther as your tag team partner to, to tackle the cross? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, that's a, wow, no, that's a very deep question. Um, um, how, how can I talk about it? Um, the last chapter of the book um, um, says, um, look, at if, if, if the incarnation is a reality statement along the lines I was just describing, um, one of the things it means um, is that a certain kind of communication of properties uh, um, conceptually articulates or explains the person of Jesus Christ. Um, he who was rich for our sakes became poor. That's an exchange of properties. Um, uh, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God something to be coveted, but he emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a servant and became obedient even to death, death upon a cross. Uh, there too, Paul is articulating a certain kind of transference or exchange the properties, the ancient church called this, as you know, communicatio idiomatum, communication of, of attributes or idioms. And what they were saying was, we're not to think, you know, of the incarnation in a docetic way 
as though some kind of heavenly spook uh, came down and inhabited the body of the man Jesus like a and animated it like a puppet. That's Apollinarianism. That's a Christological heresy. Mm-hmm. No, we have to say that Jesus uh, was a, a wholly human as you and I are in this conversation. If he were the third one sitting here with us, it would be just the three of us talking like the two of us are talking. There wouldn't be any, you know, uh, mystical aura <laughs> oozing out of his pores, you know, indicating that it's just a mask. Uh, he's a real human being. Yet this particular human being as a totality, as a whole, uh, is, is, strong word, uh, not symbolizes, not represents, not figures, not analogizes, but this particular human being is the second person of the Trinity. Mm-hmm. Now, how can that happen except that the second of the person, person of the Trinity takes the totality of that humanity and says, mine, my very own, my very, very own humanity, uh, and communicates the attributes of that poverty to, uh, to uh, his own person. And one would then say, furthermore, wouldn't one, that uh, this man forgives sins. This man heals the sick. This man stills the storm. This man rises from the dead. This man lives and reigns to eternity. You're saying all that about a creature, <laughs> about a human being. And so there's another kind of communication or exchange that occurs. Not only the humiliation of, of the divine son who takes to himself this humanity as his very own, but this assumed humanity now receives divine properties. God alone forgives. God alone heals. God alone raises the dead. And so the ancient church uh, uh, said conceptually the incarnation is not some kind of spook uh, inhabiting and animating a body like a mask. The incarnation is this marvelous exchange, this amazing exchange. Uh, the rich became poor for our sake. Or again, more specifically, Paul says, He who knew no sin was made to be sin, that we might become in him the righteousness of God. And uh, uh, Luther, a a Western Christian, who picks up these ancient Pauline and and Eastern uh, Christian ideas of, of, of the exchange, and, 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 and makes them dramatic in his usual way with his idea of the joyful exchange. Uh, the joyful exchange is a theme that goes all through Luther from early to late. Uh, and he always puts it in the voice of Christ, the bridegroom of the soul, saying, uh, uh, your sins, uh, as if Christ were saying to the soul, your sins can no longer harm you if only they displease you. For they are no longer your sins, but mine. I am the Lamb of God who bears away the sin of the world. And my righteousness is yours in turn. And so Luther has this, like Calvin's mystical union with Christ, uh, I think Calvin's mystical union is his adaption of Luther's joyful exchange. They have this idea that's, that's more than a simply forensic account of justification. There's a, there's a, a, a particular union with the crucified and risen Christ that's occurring there. All right. So that's a kind of a long, long answer to your question. But I think that, um, the, the target of my last chapter of the book is, I, you know, I, I've spoken so highly of Karl Barth. I fear there's just a residual Platonism, a residual Nestorianism in Barth's rhetoric or theology, sometimes when he speaks this way, the man Jesus is to God as the, as the son is to the father. And so there you've got two, uh, two planes of reality, a human plane and a divine plane that are in an analogical relationship. It's not an identity. It's not an actual incarnation. The incarnation symbolizes a divine relationship going on, or the, the Jesus symbolizes a relationship going on someplace else in heaven. And I, 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 I bring up this Christological point 
uh, uh, to finish the book and really then drive home how Christ is the crisis of metaphysics. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh yeah. And, um, the, the, I, I'm, one other thing that I think, if you're listening to think about, is it's rare that a theology book actually has a glossary at the end to tell you what in the world all the weird words are, ones from other, uh, other languages. Um, and it makes, uh, a book that could seem daunting, um, for someone that might not be a specialist. Uh, you're letting people in on thinking theologically. Uh, that often professional theologians uh, avoid. And, and that kind of made me think of uh, the, the, really the last question I had is, how how does it work like this? How do you imagine it being uh, received or, or, or what does it, what do you hope it empowers in the life of the church? That's great. Thank you. Well, one thing I hope it does is um, 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 help our Thomist friends to get off their high horse a little bit. Um, uh, uh, and recognize that Thomism is as internally a conflicted uh, Christian tradition as Calvinism or Lutheranism, uh, and that we're all in this together. And uh, there is plenty of medieval Catholic descent from Thomism, beginning with Scotus. Uh, And uh, so we really have to stop playing these kinds of games uh, as a Lutheran theologian, I've been quite freely critical of Luther in certain respects. I think we all have to be self-critical about our confessional traditions, uh, and 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 let the, let there be school differences, but relativize them profoundly uh, by an ecumenical commitment uh, to unity in the basic doctrines of the Church. So uh, that would, one hope I would have is is that. Um, Thomists would recognize that St. Thomas's version of simplicity is one way, a way, and in my view, a somewhat problematic way of articulating the singularity uh, of the one God. Uh, uh, and if its in Christian intention is clear, I can live in the same church with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when it makes an imperial claim that it alone <laughs> accounts for the uniqueness of God, I think that not only is a false claim, I think it's an Im- imperialistic claim. Mm-hmm. Well, Paul, thank you so much for uh, joining and talking and sharing about the book. Uh, the, the book's great. Uh, talking to you is even better. Oh, I, uh, it, it's been it's been a real treat and a blast. And uh, I hope I hope next time you have a book out, we'll get to do it again. Congratulations, Homebrewed Christianity listeners. You just finished a podcast. And for that, for that, here's the thing. I think I want to give you something. I'm doing a giveaway right now. It is the Progressive Youth Ministry Toolkit. That's right. For this month of 2017, February, we're doing a giveaway. It's a toolkit, all sorts of really cool stuff, including a uh, flask hole inside of a Bible, um, some, <laughs> and, and then lots of other things. That was just funny, and I... Yeah, so it's a Bible. It looks like a Bible. You yeah. open it up, but it holds a flask. It's cut out for a flask. Yeah. I mean, every youth minister needs that. And a headlamp. Headlamp. And a really sweet journal and, and pen, and, you know, it's, it's a really cool set. You know what I mean? Jelly bean. And also, we're giving away 30 copies of the brand new Homebrewed Christianity Guide to God. So if you want to know everything you need to know about the Almighty, then you should enter the giveaway. Um, so yeah, you should go to the website, homebrewedchristianity.com. Plus, uh, you should come if you're a youth minister to PYM, that's Progressive Youth Ministry, March 8th to 10th. And you can come early for a little theological pregame on the 7th. Uh, even if you're not a youth minister on the 8th, you can just come to the live podcast. If you like, want to be in Asheville and see some beautiful trees, or you just live there and you're like, of course I'm going to be there. I live there. Then you should come to the podcast. No excuses not to be there. None. None. Um, also, uh, if you're going to go to the event, use the code HPC. $50 off. You're welcome. Um, so the other thing I was going to say is uh, it's a secret, and I can't tell you. I know. It's a secret, but uh, soon you'll find out about it. But it'll say that you wanted to be among the first to find out about a secret. Mm, how would you do such a thing? Well, you might text the phrase, Beer Me Jesus, 
Mm. What number would you text Beer Me Jesus to? 44222. So all I have to do is text Beer Me Jesus to 44222? Yes. And then I find out about this secret that you're not allowed to talk about? Yes. Oh, that's easy. Uh, You know, and um, I don't know, who do you think might want to know about the secret? Probably everyone. Well. (laughs) (laughs) But maybe specifically people who live in certain parts of the country. Yes. Landlocked areas. Yes. You know, flyover country, perhaps. Oh, don't, they don't like it when you say that. You're I said perhaps. There. I said perhaps. Well, Ohio's eh, not really. Oh, I'm I'm pretty sure it counts. Well, maybe. Um, the Rust Belt. We're from the Rust Belt. We mm-hmm. have our own name. Oh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, anyway, if, if you want to find out about a secret, when the secret gets released, then you should check out Beer Me Jesus because, um, you know, there may be info. That arrives in your in your box before anyone else knows it about said summer plans, and, and then and, and you get the cheapest discount and everything. Yeah, it's really there's no no reason not to. Well, I know if you don't like having fun. Well, that's one. I guess. You are like this summer. What I don't want to do, I do not want to uh, nerd out with mm. my geek out with people uh, in landlocked areas. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you're a coaster and you're like I, none of that, no basket, don't do it. But if you're you're like oh that'd be awesome. Then you'll find out where where that could be possible, and you find out which of my friends with a non-American accent would uh, <laughs> be there, um, wouldn't be doing things. Yeah. So, beer me Jesus. Plus, they might just want to meet you in person, Nathan. I mean, who? Yeah. They said... I'll be there. I know. That's what I'm saying. But they are where we don't even know what it is. Exactly. That's why you got to beer me Jesus. Um, yeah. So, you know, that, that's, 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 that's all we have to say right now. But uh, thanks for listening. And remember, um, you know, we don't want to think for you. We want to think with you. Amen. Amen. Smoochie boochies. <laughs>